Welcome back to another episode of Bible Study with Candace. Um, I hope you are having an awesome week as you're getting ready to celebrate Easter. I know Easter is going to be a little bit different for most of us this year. Um, you're probably used to going to church or gathering with family and uh, getting together with a crowd, maybe taking the kids to an Easter egg hunt and doing things like that. And I know it's going to be a little bit different, but I can't help but think that God has something pretty significant, even though it's different in store for us. So just kind of keep your eyes out for what God is doing right now. Um, I have to make a confession to you before I actually dive into the lesson. So while I'm confessing, if you want to grab your Bible, we're going to be studying out of the, the book of John chapter 20. So grab your Bible and um, my confession. So um, this is a little bit out of the box for me and I miss you guys. There is nothing that replaces teaching face-to-face. -face. It is so weird. It is so awkward teaching a camera. But if this is the way we have to do it right now, this is the way we're going to do it. So I appreciate you guys being understanding, and I love you. So anyway, if you have a commentary, awesome. If you don't, grab your Bible. Um, as we usually do, as I said, we're studying out of the book of John. And of course, this week we are studying one of my favorite things. Really, it is the foundation of our Christian faith. Without the belief in this, nothing else stands. So we're studying about the empty tomb. The title is Empty Tomb, Living Savior. And, you know, different gospels give us different accounts. I love reading John. John just has a very special heart, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, John chapter 20, the focus today is review the events of Christ's resurrection and worship and serve him as our risen savior. And I hope that you, even though you're not at church, that you're still finding ways to worship God at home, that you're finding ways to serve him. Cause if we can't serve him in our homes, how are we going to serve him whenever the churches open back up? So um, serve God where you are. Worship God where you are right now. Our golden text comes from Mark 16 and 6. And it says this, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. I love that proclamation. He is risen. He is not here Behold the place where they laid him. So, um, golden text, kind of the highlight of what we're going to be studying about today. So, without further ado, let's kind of dive in the, into the word together. So, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, and it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Okay, I wanna stop right there for a second, but because before we can truly understand what's taken place here, you know, sometimes when I read scripture, I like to put myself in their shoes. Whatever I'm reading about, I try to put myself there at the scene. What was it like from their perspective? And I want to give you a little bit of perspective of what this might have been like from Mary Magdalene's viewpoint. First of all, we have to understand who is Mary Magdalene. Well, we know that Mary Magdalene was a disciple of Jesus. She wasn't one of the 12, but she was one of the many that after her encounter with Jesus, she believed that he was the Messiah and she continued to follow him. Um, what was Mary's life like before her encounter with Jesus? Well, scripture tells us that she was possessed by seven demons. Now, I don't want to debate right now about demon possession. Is it possible? Does it still happen? Sometimes we just have to take the word at its word. And it says that Mary was possessed by seven demons. 
and there's significance in the writer telling us that it was seven demons because if you understand numerology in scripture, seven means complete. You know what that tells me? Okay, let's talk about these demons, this possession. I think we can agree that the possession was a problem, that it affected Mary's life. And she had seven demons, which tells me she was completely surrounded by her problems. If she tried to go north, there's her problem. If she tries to look south, there's her problem. She looks to the right, there's her problem. She cannot outrun her problems. How would this demon possession affect Mary's life? Well, we learn a little bit about what the life of a demoniac would have been like whenever we read in Mark's gospel about Jesus healing the demoniac. It would have affected her in her physical being, in her body, because we learn from the demoniac that he, under the influence of those powers, was trying to cause himself harm by cutting himself. And man, people, I'm not going to dwell too long here, but if you know a kid or you know someone that has a kid, especially a teenager, all you have to do is say the word cutting and they're going to know what that means. This is not a new problem. And Satan has not come up with new ways to try to uh, cause us issues and problems. And we still see this taking place today. And so Mary very likely wanted to cause herself bodily harm. She would have suffered psychologically. I mean, from the viewpoint of someone watching the demoniac, he was crazy. And so we know that Mary would have probably looked like a lunatic. <laughs> and have your problems ever been so big in your life, so massive, so completely surrounded you that you thought you were gonna go crazy? I hope you haven't, but I know I have felt like I've been there before. And Mary had probably some psychological issues. She was probably hearing some voices in her head, maybe not audibly, but um, if ever you've tried to do the right thing, you know, Satan's going to come against us sometimes and he's going to whisper lies, doubt, uh, deceit. He did it to Eve in the garden. And so um, poor Mary was plagued. Um, she would have suffered emotionally because let's face it, who wants to hang out with somebody possessed by seven devils? Who wants to hang out with somebody that's crazy? Who wants to hang out with somebody and be around somebody that can barely hold her own head up? And so socially and emotionally, she would, would have been very affected by this problem. So she had a desperate need for somebody to rescue her. And that rescuer, that savior was Jesus. And after her encounter with Jesus, she was not the same. Her life was completely turned around when she was healed and delivered by the power of Jesus. And she was not somebody that was just healed and delivered, but she walked by faith after that. Oftentimes in scripture, after her deliverance, you're, if you see Jesus, you're going to hear about Mary not being too far away. Um, she's actually one of the very few disciples that we hear is at the foot of the cross. She is one of the few disciples that um, we are going to read about was at the crucifixion. She is one of the few disciples that was at the burial of Jesus. And here we see her on the morning of what we know is resurrection morning, what we celebrate, um, how we celebrate Easter, or the reason that we celebrate Easter. And we see her going to the tomb that morning. And you know what that tells me? Mary loved Jesus. She never forgot what he did for her. All in the world she'd have to do, do is 
look back and remember what her life was like before Jesus and know that she owed Jesus everything. And so Mary was grateful. And the scripture tells us that she's coming to the tomb while it is yet dark. Now, I think that's so significant, and I want to talk about that for just a second. I know that one of the big reasons that she was going to the tomb um, in the hours before dawn was because the Jews were looking for the disciples. I mean, they had already killed their Jesus. What was going to stop them from killing them? And so it was just safer for her to travel in the darkness. But I want to mention this right here, and maybe I'm speaking to you. Mary didn't wait for the light to move closer to Jesus, to seek out Jesus. She sought him out while it was yet dark. And you know what? We are living in times that if we're just being honest, it's kind of a dark season, isn't it? I know that um, quarantine has not affected all of us in the same way. I know for some of you, you are one of our essential workers and thank you so much for continuing to get out. But then there are some people like myself that I think I can count three places I've been in the last two weeks. Two of them were to the grocery store and one was to the post office. I go outside here, I take little walks, but for the most part, I'm at home. I'm, my life is very different. And I think we can all agree that life has been very different the last couple of weeks. And we're living in times that are dark, that seem to be dark. Um, you know, you turn on the news or you pull up Facebook or whatever social media that you're on, look on the internet, and you're gonna see something about this virus affecting people. And you're gonna see something about people getting sick and maybe even dying, and that is a real threat. But I want you to know that you do not have to hide in the darkness. The light is displayed best when it is dark. Think about that for a second. Like right now, outside my home, I'm looking out the window right there and it's daylight. I don't need a flashlight or a candle to go outside. That would be silly. If I were to go outside with my flashlight, you would not even be able to tell that the light was on. But wait till tonight after the sun goes down and the world is dark. And then I flip on that light suddenly you can see what was there all along. But because things got dark, the light was illuminated more. And I just wonder if that's not what God is doing right now in this day and hour, is he's allowed things to get a little bit darker for us so that his light that's always been displayed, but we were blinded by other things that distracted us and we couldn't see it. It was always there, but as things have gotten darker, we're able to see his light better. So Mary is going to the empty tomb. What, we, what she's going to discover is the empty tomb. And her intention is to draw closer to Jesus, to, to anoint his body with spices and oils. So verse 2, then she runneth, oh wait, Let's back up to verse one. Because she went out while it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So Mary discovers when she gets there that the stone's been rolled away. She likely looked in, saw that Jesus's body was gone and is thinking, oh no, somebody has stolen my Jesus's body. So now we pick up in verse two. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. I can just imagine, now I'm just kind of reading that, but I can imagine Mary's kind of frantic. She probably ran as hard and as fast as she could back to those disciples, and she encounters Peter and John, and she wakes them up, 
and she's probably scrambling, shaking them, breathing hard, and in her heavy breath saying, Jesus is gone, somebody's stolen him. So she's frantic. She's in a panic right now. Mm. A lot of us, uh, the world, is in a panic right now. And so I have to take a little break here and teach. I love, as you read John's gospel, he writes his accounts of his life with Jesus from the third person. So we see John refers to himself oftentimes as the disciple that Jesus loved. And I love that. John was so confident in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And folks, I want y'all to know that if you are, even if you're not a disciple, God loves you. And I have people tell me sometimes that they doubt their salvation. They doubt God's love for them. There is no reason for you to doubt God's love for you. God, you are the disciple whom Jesus loved. Sometimes we need the spirit of John to rise up inside of us and say, I know who I am. I know that my God loves me. So in confidence, John and Peter raise up. And so they follow. And for sake of time, because like I said, I'm trying to make these videos as short as possible. Um, I'm going to skip over a few verses. So in the next few verses, Peter and John run. And I love that John kind of throws in there that um, he outran Peter. And um, they get to the tomb. And this is what the scene looked like. The scripture tells us that they find the linen wrapping that would have encased the body of Jesus laid aside. And that just makes me think, if robbers had robbed the tomb of Jesus, would they have taken the time to unwrap the body? I mean, this body would, his body would have been wrapped multiple times, um, encased with anointing oil. Is somebody who's going to steal a body out of a grave really going to take the time to unwrap the body? I don't think so. So for me, that's one clue in the evidence for Jesus Christ, that he was resurrected rather than stolen from the tomb, and that that's the reason the tomb was empty. And then, I'm telling you what, this next verse, when I set out to study this lesson, this wasn't even my focal point, but as God started speaking to my heart, it quickly became my focal point. Verse 7 and the napkin that was about his head, so there was a separate napkin that covered the head of Jesus. The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, why is John specific about how the linen and the napkin were placed inside the empty tomb because there's a message there. I researched the significance of the folded napkin. You know, <laughs> parents, if you have kids and um, you ever walk in their room, <laughs> have you ever seen clothes laying here, there, and everywhere where they didn't take time to fold things? Yet the Savior took time to fold the napkin and place it separately from the linen wrapping. Why was that? Well, to understand what Jesus is trying to say, the significance of the napkin being folded, you have to understand the culture at that time. And this was a signal that was often used between a master and a servant. So you think about a dinner taking place and the servant, of course, is serving the master. It was very important that the servant be as unnoticed, unnoticed as possible. 
kind of my depiction that I have in my mind. One of my, I guess you would call guilty pleasures is Downton Abbey or anything historical like that, royalty, all of that stuff. And, and oftentimes in shows like that, you will see them at this big banquet table and the servants, as they are serving the masters, they do what they need to do, but then they, they never speak and they step back and they just watch and they're quiet. So there was a signal that the master would give to the servant. And I don't have a linen napkin because we just do not use things like that in our house. And I was not going to waste a paper towel because that's what we do use. And that's a very precious commodity right now. So I have this little washcloth, this dish towel. And, you know, think about when you're out at a restaurant that uses um, a cloth napkin. And maybe you need to excuse yourself from the table for whatever reason for just a moment. Okay, so if the master was going to leave the table and he was completely done with his meal, he would do this, you know, think about it. Wipe your mouth, wipe your beard, and wad it up and get up and leave. So the wadded napkin was a sign to the servant, I'm done, I'm finished. But if the master was leaving the table for just a moment, ex just excusing himself, had to go do something else, but is planning on coming back and finishing the meal, then the master would take the time to fold the napkin and then lay it down, signifying to that servant, I'm coming back. And I want to tell you right now, Jesus folded that napkin. He did not wad it up and set it aside saying, I'm finished. Now, I know he cried, I'm finished from the cross. But you have to understand what was finished was the death. What was finished was the sacrifice. What was finished was his work. But the miracle was just beginning. And in that tomb, when he rose, he took the time to fold the napkin for his servants that he knew would be coming by to tell them, I'm not finished, but I'm coming back. And church, we are living in a day and time that the master is saying, I'm coming back. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but the master is going to return. How do I know that? The miracle of the empty tomb, the signs that we have that he told us in scripture to look for. And so today, I celebrate the miracle of the empty tomb. I celebrate the miracle of the folded napkin to know that my God is not done, that my God is not finished, that he still has his eyes on this world, and that he's still getting ready to bust heaven open for his church. I gotta get back to scripture. This excites me so much. So normally in Sunday school, when I teach this lesson out of John's gospel, I focus on Mary Magdalene and I focus on her encounter with Jesus, which we read about next. And it's a beautiful story in your own time. Continue to read that because I'm going to tell you, we all need our own encounter with the risen Savior. We all need to hear him when he calls our name. Mary didn't know that she was speaking to the risen Savior until he spoke her name. And whenever he spoke her name, she said, Rabbani. She recognized who he was. But that's not what, where I want to focus. This is where I want to end. So let's skip down to verse 8. It says, then went in also that other disciple, John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. So John saw the scene. He saw the folded napkin. He saw the linen laying aside. And it says he believed. But verse 9 says this, For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Now, what that speaks to me is they didn't yet understand 
what was taking place. But something about that scene caused them to believe. And you know what? You might not understand everything going on in your life right now. You might not understand this season. You might not understand your situation. You might not understand your problems that you're facing. But I want you to know that you do not have to understand everything. All you have to do is believe. Believe there is a risen Savior. Believe that we serve a God who is mighty. Believe that we serve a God with resurrection power. Now, I want to skip down to verse 19. And Mary Magdalene, she has her encounter. And then it talks about later that evening. And a couple of weeks ago, before I even knew what scriptures that the lesson was going to be out of today, God laid these scriptures on my heart. And I want to finish with this. Verse 19 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, were the disciples where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So the Jews, the disciples that evening are hiding away in their homes or in a, someone's home. And they are shut up behind closed doors. Why are they shut up behind clo closed doors? For fear. Mm. What are we doing right now? but being shut up behind closed doors for fear. Like I said, I know not everybody is, and thank you for you essential workers, but we are under a quarantine. Like, we've never seen this in my lifetime where the world almost shuts down and closes their doors and stays behind shut doors for fear. And it's not something new. The disciples went through that as well. And it goes on. And while they were sitting there behind closed doors in fear, it says, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be unto you. So right there behind closed doors, in the middle of the fear, in the middle of their situation, in walks Jesus to the middle of that situation. And what did Jesus do? He spoke peace unto them. And so I'm speaking to somebody today, this morning, this afternoon, whatever time you are watching this video, God has the power to walk right into your situation, right into wherever you are sitting right now and speak peace to your situation, speak peace to your heart, speak peace to your soul. You don't have to live in fear if you serve Christ. And so he spoke peace unto them. In verse 20, that's where I'm going to finish. It says, and when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So joy came into that house when God walked in and spoke peace to their situations. When they saw his hands, when they saw his side, it says the disciples were glad. But I want to tell you this, the situation outside those closed doors didn't change. There was still a threat outside. But what took place on the inside changed. And you might not have control over what's going on outside of your situation, outside of your four walls, but you do have control on what you allow to come in. You can allow fear to come in and hinder you and drive you crazy, or you can let Jesus, the peace speaker, the peacemaker, walk in to the middle of that room where you're sitting, the middle of your situation, and speak peace and experience joy when things around you are still dark. I hope this has helped somebody. I hope that you have a wonderful and blessed Resurrection Sunday. And I'm thinking about all of you guys. I'm praying for you guys. Let's continue to pray for our people that are working, for um, people that are sick, and just continue to reach out, remember one another, and let's finish by praying. 
Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just love you so much, God. Lord, we thank you for this time together that we can celebrate you, our Savior. God, we thank you for the Holy Ghost. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that four walls and a locked door does not hinder. God, I thank you that I don't need a church building to worship you. God, I thank you that I can worship you right here in the middle of my home. God, I thank you for the reason that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you so much for loving us so much that you sent your only son. God, I pray for your people, that you would protect us, God, that you would strengthen us, God, and Lord, help us to continue persevering, pressing on, as Brother Paul said, until we cross that finish line. Lord, we love you, honor, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all.